Uh, Cornelius and Harry and uh, I are now joined by Laura Pearson, who made uh, a stunning start to her career as an apprentice rider before injury intervened. But this week, you're back. I'm back. And how do you feel? Brilliant, yeah. It's good to be back. I bet it is. It's been quite a long road. I mean, it seems like yesterday to me that you were riding, but actually it's been, what, six, six months or so? Six, six seven months, months? Yeah, six months altogether. The f first three months were hard. I, um, I fought the process a lot, but... As I said on an interview the other day, it just once you realise that this is the position that you're in, mm. make the most of what you have. Okay, so what happened and when? So the 28th of July, so my saddle slipped, yeah. um, slipped round, I fell into the horse's legs next to me, so I fractured my C7. Which is high up, isn't it? Uh, it's like the bottom of your neck. Yeah. Um, so yeah, awfully concussed for a very long time. <laughs> Did you know straight away that it was bad? Um, well, apparently I was making jokes in the ambulance, so <laughs> I don't know, I can't really remember if I'm honest. I remember it took me a few days to get the race back and the day back. Mm -hmm. um, I remember the saddle slipping um, and going, but then I don't remember anything else other than waking up in the hospital. And then you knew you'd had a, a neck fracture yeah. and the concussion was bad. So mm -hmm. how were you in yourself for those next next few weeks? Were you pretty disorientated I mean I thought I was great I was already <laughs> had in the diary as well. I'll be back on the racetrack in a month once I get this neck race off don't need it for six weeks um, but everybody else around me could see it obviously and looking back on it now you see how disorientated you actually were when you thought you were fine um, so yeah I, I looked at your Twitter feed just around about the time of the of the fall and the diagnosis came out and you just put above it we go again with a big strength <laughs> strength emotion I'm thinking what, what, what was she thinking at that, at that, at that moment exactly um, just keep going I've, I've, I've had a few knockbacks the last three years and um, it was just another one to add to the pile I guess it's interesting you say that because you know from the outside it's been quite a quite a strong start good good success story mm -hmm. Tell me why it's been a bit more, more complicated than that, if it has. So, m my racing career, I, I, I can't fault. It's been, it's been brilliant and it's something that I threw everything into. But, so in 2020, when I was 19, I lost my dad mm -hmm. quite quickly to pancreatic cancer. Um, and then in 2021, I lost my boyfriend to a brain tumour. So in 2022, I then fractured my neck. Oh, here we go, <laughs> another one. But I've done my three now, so hopefully that's all over. Um, but look, I... I I used those bad points and put it all into my career um, and whether or not it's the right, that's the right way of dealing with those kind of losses, I don't know, but it's the way that I have and it's helped me and I've tried to turn it into good anyway. Dad was huge in your, in your career, wasn't he, as well, and as, as well as obviously in, in your life, because was it not him point to pointing that, that star started you off? It was, yeah, Dad. Dad was, sounds cringy, but my hero, and he always will be. He's, he's, he was the most important, or is still the most important person. Um, and yeah, he, he he taught me and my sister f from a very young age. He was probably a lot harder than <laughs> most parents would be, but I thank him for it now because I feel like it's made me a better person. And so he was a he was a great rider, mm. good teacher, mm. and. <laughs> Hard school? Yeah, old school. He was old school. So tell me a little bit about, about growing up and, and, and you and your sister. So we grew up in France. Mm -hmm. So I moved to France when I was three. Um, what, spent what took you guys to France? I don't know. It's, oh, it's going to come out. They were meant to be arrested or something at some point, then they ran away from the country, but no. Um, so we, I think it was just a fresh start. I don't know if it was mum or dad's idea. Mm -hmm. um, so we spent seven years in there, which... Again, at the time, I hated. I was like, "This is awful. I want to go back to England, where there's Galaxy and Aero and nice chocolates instead of these horrible French chocolates." <laughs> um, but I look back on it now, and I can't thank them enough because I grew up on a farm. I probably thought I was a little boy for most of it, um, and I just had a real childhood. You know, was it that kind of? You know, you you see 
sort of scenes of idyllic rural France in films. Was it was it like that? It was, yeah. So we were in the Limousin and um, surrounded by sheep and grew up on a farm. Something out of a storybook, really. <laughs> so really a, a gorgeous childhood mm. in a lot of ways. Yeah. So when did you come back to England? And when you did come back to England, <laughs> did you actually want to come back? Um, I did, yeah. I was really excited. So I came back, moved back when I was 10. Um, so I had to teach myself how to read and write English in that summer holidays. Mm -hmm. But we decided we were coming back, so um, yeah, I, I I was really excited. <laughs> How's your French now? Is your French still really good? Um, it's there. When we go skiing, it's it's in the back of my head. Is I can understand them, but when I speak French, I seem to just speak English with a French accent. <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> quite <laughs> click. Um, but yeah, I can understand them like they're speaking English to me. But you had to you had to teach yourself English and and reassimilate. Tell me so. Tell me about life when you came back how was it different um it was a big cultural change um i think i threw myself into horses horses are always my safe spot um i i have had a very naughty pony my first pony i see i look back on it now i think dad probably was trying to put me off it was an unbroken colt um that i had to break in myself so i had to learn on the ride to ride on that as well um, so when I came back to England and got myself a nice pony, got into a, like a bit of venting and pony mm -hmm. racing. And so then the, the idea of becoming a jockey was starting to, starting to form, or had it always been there, even from when you were little and being taught at three, four, five? I remember watching videos of my dad, like point to point in an Arab racing. I was like, yeah, that's what I want to do. It was a mixture of horses and sports and competitiveness. So it was exactly <laughs> what I was all about at the time. So could there could there have been another sporting career? Uh, could there still be another sporting career? I don't know. I think I've lost all aspects of that. But I was big into my cricket when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Cricket was probably my main one. And cricket I in France? No, 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 no. no. In England. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> I was going to say that 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 would have that would have been pretty unusual. And so you you set off on the trail to to being an apprentice. Mm -hmm. When did things start to start to take shape? Start to click for you? When did you feel like you belonged? what in, in, in the racing in, yeah. industry um it was probably about five months after my dad passed away mm -hmm. um i started at mr clover's tom clover's um and i had a ride at newcastle one evening in the half seven i believe it was on a filly called herrings are um for the champagne poppers that just started all off and my agent my current agent now stephen croft rang me and he was like yeah i'll take you on my books um and it's been flying ever since. He's obviously a big support to you, isn't he? Um, he's a he's a, a wholehearted guy and, and has, has has backed you. How important has he been for your for your career and your development? Oh, brilliant. He's he taught me not he's not just an agent to me, he, like he'd go through races with me. He's almost like a jockey coach. Mm -hmm. Um like just small tactics, just he's brilliant. I I mean I would be lost without him. And did you believe uh, early on that you you had something that you had a you're wrinkling your nose <laughs> why um i don't know i don't want to sound too confident <laughs> but you've you've clearly got a, a talent everyone saw it but were you were you always that very comfortable as a jockey on a horse in a race i'm probably a lot safer on a horse than i am on my own two feet yeah <laughs> <laughs> what makes you not safe on your on your own two feet <laughs> Oh, you don't want to know. <laughs> okay. I won't ask. But um, in terms of the in terms of the riding career, you you made it as I say a very bright start as an apprentice, and as you say on the horse everything was going well. Off the horse things weren't going quite so well for you. Um, could you get yourself mentally in the right place to do what you were supposed to be doing in a race? Um, yeah, racing was like like a breath of fresh air because I could just concentrate on that. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't anything else. Um, so yeah, race, racing was like my my saving grace, can I say? And the break that you've had this this six months has it has it changed you at all? Massively. Yeah, I, as I said, I, f I threw everything into the racing, and when that was taken away, I just didn't know what to do. Didn't know what to do with myself, and it made me finally actually speak to someone about it all and go across it 
in a better way, in a more healthier way, I guess some could say. Um, so the IJF were brilliant for that. So mentally and physically, the IJF did loads for me. And your your physical determination to get back, you said something I've read in the paper today about that the, the you nearly got a room in Peter Sullivan <laughs> House. Yeah, I think they, they end up kicking me out, if I'm honest. I was in there for most of the hours of the day, just mooching around, eating all their fruit that they left out. Um, yeah, I was, I've become their hermit. <laughs> So d did you feel that the, the place itself was as much of a, a haven for you to put you in the right place, as you say, mentally, as it was to heal you, to heal your body? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I, I've become very, I've probably got some kind of detachment problem from it now, <laughs> if I'm honest. But when you spend some, like, six months in the same place every day for all day, I'm, I'm sure you get that. But, yeah, no, I, they do a lot for us. So... Clearly, nobody wants a serious injury. You've had serious injuries, Harry, riding uh, you know, all, all through your career. Nobody wants to be, to be injured badly. Nobody wants a spell on the sidelines. When you look back on it, though, in the fullness of time, do you think this period actually could have been a, a blessing in some respect? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I think it is. And I, I'd love to turn around and say, and say no, but as a... As a 21-year-old that hasn't done anything else with her life yet, like nothing, it, racing has just always been the since I was about 14. Mm -hmm. um, it just made me breathe, and it's something that I go back to. Dad, Dad said to me on his last few days, he said, "Don't forget to live," and that was from a man that I saw that just worked every single day, and he's the most hard-working man that I think I'll ever see. Um, so for him to say that. And I probably didn't take that into account until these six months came. So to me. those words really resonating with you, mm. that you've got to live and you've got to enjoy it. Mm. You were saying earlier on the importance of enjoying what you're doing. And relatively few people riding top class sport, uh, playing top class sport, are able to do that. It's, it's, a, yeah. it's, a, it's a fascinating thing. It is. Um, like Laura's expression to there is, you know, her, you can see her, her love for the sport, her love for the horses, and that's what drives her on. But you've got to enjoy it and just be yourself. It's, you get a lot of, I think, especially now with social media, you get a lot of opinions and, you know, why is he doing that or why is she doing this? Do that, you know. But actually, just be yourself. And if you can be yourself and just live it and just enjoy it, I mean, that's what it's all about. You've been, you've been champion jockey, part of an exclusive club. You're part of an, an exclusive club, Laura, that hopefully will become much, much less exclusive, which is you're one of only a handful of female riders to have won a race at, at Royal Ascot. And, and like that, right off, the, right off the beginning of your career as well. What was, that, what was that moment like? It was incredible, but do you know what? When I came in to the weighing room, I went, right, next year I've got to get two then, otherwise I'm not going to be happy. <laughs> and... It turned out the following year I didn't ride at the meeting and I just, I couldn't, I couldn't deal with it. I was like, oh my God, I've gone backwards, this is it, it's all over. Um, but yeah, I think it just, it taught me to just really enjoy those moments because you never know, it could be your last one. Like I could have become paralysed after that fall and I never got a chance to ride a horse again. Mm. So I think it, it, I'll definitely come back into this season with a different mindset from it. I mean, it's quite something, isn't it, to to walk into that Ascot Winners enclosure? And I know it was the COVID year, and it was a wasn't the kind of crowd that you might have wanted, but to just to do that must have been pretty awe inspiring. Oh, it was yeah, it was incredible, and and to do it for for Mr. Lockman and Dave is even more of a fairy tale for me because he's picked my career up and he's done it again. My first ride back was for him um, about six nine six times now. He just scoops me back up again when I go quiet, so yeah, it was really, it was brilliant. And you, you paid tribute to Hayley Turner and particularly to Holly Doyle after that. Um, it sounds from what you say as though Holly's been very important for you, n not just as a, as a role model, but, but practically as well. Tell me a bit more about that. Um, yeah, she's, re she's really good. I, I know when I was working for, for Mr Evans, Holly had obviously started out there before, so. Mm -hmm. I could speak to her on a on a personal level um, with all those aspects, and she's always there to help. And you couldn't meet a kinder person 
than than Holly. And so, if you if you're just sort of feeling that you're not quite sure about something, would she be one of the first people you would you you would ask? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and it's obviously it's obviously working pretty well. <laughs> you mentioned Mr. Evans. That's Dave Evans. Yeah. Tom Clover and Newmarket. Yeah. They're quite. Quite different, quite different personalities. <laughs> and Rafe on Dave top. Dave Evans to Tom Clover. <laughs> and, then a, and then a bit of Rafe Beckett on the top. Yeah. Um, how is it down at Rafe's now? It's brilliant, yeah. It's a completely different different thing. And I, I really enjoyed looking at different, going to different places um, because Dave Evans taught me how to work hard. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you have to graft and you're there. And I'd send any person coming out the racing school there because... If, if you still love it when you're there and you have to work hard, then you'll be in the industry for the rest of your life. Um, Tom Clover was brilliant for my career. He, he set me off. He, he spent a lot of time with me, did a lot of fractions work with me on the gallops at home. Um, and Mr. Beckett is just the class of horses and how, how intelligent he is, is. It's just I'm so fortunate to work with a man mm. like him. So how long have you been at, at Raves? Uh, we're coming up to a year now. Okay. Or just over a year, sorry. And so it's only now, really, that you're starting to, because of your injury, you're starting to get in and, and sit on some of those really mm. classy horses. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great. I mean, Mr. Clover had, had good horses in, this, in his yard, but then you go to Rafe's and you sit on all these group horses like, like they're just normal horses to mm -hmm. him, and oh, it's incredible. And so are you setting targets or not? I try not to because then if I don't reach them, I'm not a very happy person to be around. <laughs> um, so I, I, I think I'm just going to try and go with the flow this season instead of the big goals that I set myself before. You're quite hard on yourself, aren't you? <laughs> I don't know about that. I think we all are. Um, can you marry that with, with being at, at ease when you're not on a horse? Can you marry being hard on yourself and driving yourself and pushing yourself forward with, with that newfound ability to be a bit more centred? Mm. I think so, yeah. I think so, we'll see. I'll let you know next year. <laughs> <laughs> see if I've pulled my hair out or not. <laughs> and not far off losing your claim either? No. Is that, how do you feel about that? Do you feel, do you feel good about how close you are to it and is it, is it something that's driving you forward? I do, yeah. I, I, this time last year, I was a little bit stressing about oh, are people only using me for my claim still, or are they actually using me for me? And the only person that I could say hands down was using me for me was Dave Lochnan. Um, but now I'd, I'd strongly say every trainer I have around me is <laughs> using me for me and not my claim. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to lose it now. And as you say, it's been tough, but you feel good. And you feel strong, yeah. which are two <laughs> excellent things. For the moment, Laura, thank you very much. Watch live racing now on racingtv.com.